Yeah, thank you very much um, for your coming. Now we have um, our discussion group about uh, Syria and your and our impression of the Syrian policy. And um, you, Senator Richard Black, are very skilled in this topic. You was there. You was a high potential in the U.S. administration and in the U.S. Army. And so we are very glad to see you in our group. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Glad, glad I could be with you today. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I want to give uh, to, to our colleague, he was um, leader of um, two delegations um, in Syria. And uh, yes, Frank Pasemann, please. Thank you. I prefer German, but he will translate. Okay, okay. that's good. Um, die, Syrisch, die Syrien Kontaktgruppe ist gebildet worden innerhalb der AfD Fraktion im Deutschen Bundestag. Wir wollten uns eine eigene Meinung zu der Situation in Syrien bilden. Wir wollten vor Ort Informationen sammeln, um diese in unsere politische Arbeit hier einfließen zu lassen. Wir sind der Meinung gewesen, dass das, was in Syrien passiert, es wert ist, untersucht zu werden und dass wir in unserer Meinungsbildung nicht dem folgen, was in den westlichen Gazetten, Zeitungen, Rundfunkanstalten verbreitet wurde. Wir sind äh, in zwei Reisen dort vor Ort gewesen, sind, äh, haben Gespräche gehabt mit äh, hohen Regierungsverantwortlichen. Äh, Wir waren zu Gast in der, äh, hilf mir, wie heißt das, Volkskammer nicht, sondern? National Assembly. Ja, gut, also in der Nationalversammlung haben auch einige ähm, Abgeordnete dort sehr gut kennengelernt, die dann auch recht freimütig gesprochen haben. Wir haben auch ähm, die Geistlichkeit kennengelernt, also auch aller Kontakte. Versionen, die dort noch vorhanden waren. Wir haben festgestellt, dass äh, man Präsident, äh, Präsident Assad und seiner Regierung manches vorwerfen kann, aber eins muss man ihm zugutehalten, er hat das Land zusammengehalten, äh, trotz der Bedrohungen äh, aus verschiedenen Richtungen und er hat auch dafür gesorgt, dass die äh, Religionsfreiheit im Land gewährleistet war. Ja. Wir haben die schreckliche Zerstörung des Bürgerkrieges gesehen mit eigenen Augen. Wir waren in Aleppo, wir waren in Homs. Bei unserem ersten Besuch in Damaskus 2018 äh, tobte gerade die Schlacht um Ostguta. Äh, wir haben die Einschläge im Hotel gehört und äh, verfolgt, wie sich der Kessel immer weiter zusammenzog, bis es dann schließlich befriedet war. Wir wollten uns vor allen Dingen auch einen Eindruck verschaffen, wie das Eingreifen der ähm, Russen dort zu bewerten ist. Ob es äh, eine Aggression ist oder ein Übernahmekrieg, wie man das in den westlichen Medien behauptet hat, oder ob es wirklich darum ging, dort äh, eine Befriedung vorzunehmen. Wir konnten feststellen, ihr korrigiert mich bitte, wenn ich Mist erzähle, aber wir konnten feststellen, dass die, die Russen dort wirklich militärische, aber auch humanitäre Hilfe geleistet haben. Und wenn man bedenkt, welche Zerstörungen die Islamisten oder der IS in Teilen des Landes und vor allen Dingen auch in den großen Städten Homs und Aleppo angerichtet hat, sind wir zu der Überzeugung gelangt, dass, das ein, dass der Einsatz der Russen richtig war und auch angemessen war. Ja. Wir sind dann nach unserer Rückkehr ähm, im Deutschen Bundestag mit verschiedenen Anträgen und Anfragen vorstellig gewesen, haben äh, vorgeschlagen, dass wir Syrien mit Hilfspaketen unterstützen. Der Hintergrund äh, dieser Vorschläge war natürlich auch, dass wir in Deutschland inzwischen, inzwischen sind es über eine Million Syrer, damals waren es sieben, über 700.000 Syrer haben und wir wollten äh, diesen Menschen Gelegenheit geben, mit einer entsprechenden Finanzierung in ihre Heimat zurückzukehren und dort den Wiederaufbau zu beginnen. Wir haben mit dieser Initiative auch versucht, die politische Isolation der Syrer zu beenden. Sie werden seit Jahren nirgendwo mehr international eingeladen. Man schneidet sie diplomatisch. Ein bestes Beispiel dafür ist die Situation, dass wir in Deutschland nur eine, ich will mal keine Botschaft, sondern eine 
Vertretung. Eine Vertretung haben, eine, eine diplomatische Vertretung, keine Botschaft. Und wir wollten auch in einem Antrag durchsetzen, dass wir sowohl in die deutsche Botschaft in Damaskus wieder eröffnen, als auch die Vertretung in Berlin wieder auf den Status einer Botschaft zu bringen. Letztendlich haben unsere Bemühungen nichts erbracht. Der damalige Außenminister Maas sagte uns lediglich, dass die deutsche Regierung derzeit über keinerlei Hilfsmaßnahmen nachdenke und auch alle anderen Vorschläge, die wir machten, wurden einfach abgelehnt ohne weitere Diskussion. Ein Zustand, der dazu geführt hat, dass Syrien inzwischen ja, eigentlich schon direkt am Abgrund steht, also noch schlimmer, der Zust die Zustände noch schlimmer sind, als wir sie festgestellt haben. Und äh, das ist eine, eine Schande, die die Weltgemeinschaft sich äh, zuschreibt. Yes, yes. <coughs> you know, I, I just add, you mentioned the Russians and their, the role that they played. Uh, it's mostly been an air role. They had some small units, they had some, uh, some artillery, some military police and so forth, mostly to secure the area of the airfields because uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda had launched a great attack and, uh, and that was, uh, the, the Russians had avoided getting involved in the war for four years, almost more than that, four and a half years. And it was with great reluctance that they went in. They didn't, they weren't looking for some war to stir up. They, they put it off as long as they could. And, uh, but they went in, they spent a couple of weeks setting up, getting the area secured. Uh, and uh, then ISIS was running thousands of gasoline tankers across the border into Turkey. And, uh, and uh, the, the U.S., the, you know, all of, the, all of the coalition allies had never touched it, never once touched it. <clears throat> and of course, they knew that that was the lifeline for ISIS. But uh, Russia went in, and uh, I believe on the very first day, they destroyed 500 gasoline tankers. It was just this enormous, conflagration, this huge fire of gasoline tankers. And then uh, I spoke with, uh, I, it was a general who was in, in charge of military intelligence. And uh, I commented on the destruction of the, the gasoline tankers. And he, I said 500, he said now, he says 2,000. So they had destroyed 2,000. Within three weeks after they first launched their attack, ISIS announced that it was cutting all of their salaries 50%. So you could see the dramatic financial blow that that was. And it just required a little common sense and a little sincerity, uh, which the Russians had it. They were sincerely out to interdict ISIS, whereas I'm not sure exactly what we were trying to accomplish, but we weren't accomplishing much. Uh, so, yeah, I, I certainly agree that, uh, that Russia was a, a great benefit. And, uh, uh, and then uh, the, the idea of, of having diplomatic relations, why not have diplomatic relations with nations? You know, you, you have a lot of Syrians living here. Uh, you have, you know, you have reasons to have a, have a diplomatic uh, presence. So I, I think all of those are very sound policies. We came to the conclusion that it's very important uh, what the U.S. does. So if the U.S. decides somewhere in the world, in some scenario and theater to get in, uh, NATO and willing partners are joining, and when they are leaving, they are leaving too, without on short notice, <laughs> very short notice, perhaps, if there's a notice at all. And therefore, the only hope for the Syrian people is not the European Parliament in Brussels, which made could decide independently what the United States government is doing. But they are reacting in the same way and in the same pace as the US government. So it, the decision has to be made in Washington 
I'm afraid that uh, the ban to, of uh, Syria and the banning of Assad is lifted, and that's the precondition, I think, that there's any alternative Syrian policy and Middle East policy. Do you see it the same way? And are there any, are there any movements towards these directions, even minority ones? I'm afraid there's a lot of truth to that. I, I, the EU and NATO don't operate independently of the United States. Uh, the United States and Great Britain uh, simply dominate these things. They make the decisions, and uh, it's unfortunate because I think, I think the world's a healthier place where individual nations look out for their own interests because that's the only way that they can look after their own citizens. The bigger you have these global organizations, nobody really cares about the citizen from Germany or the citizen from the United States. They, the citizens are lost. They're just lumps of coal in a big pile. Uh, and, and then you have the power brokers, the wheelers and the dealers and the, uh, the multi-billionaires who come together and and some of these are pretty squirrely fellows. They, you know, they don't think like ordinary people. And uh, they seem to like wars, they benefit, they profit from wars. It's very sad, you know, that uh, the, most of these wars could be avoided, uh, but, but they're not. But no, I, I agree, it's, it's very difficult in today's political climate for, uh, for the EU to move independently of the United States. I don't know when we're going to shift policy. Uh, I, I hope we will at some point, but uh, we're going to need some new faces in office. But to act um, uh, without uh, U.S. Uh, permission, it is only a thing by uh, German and uh, the EU. Uh, we have to say, yes, we want to be independent, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's it, but uh, yeah, nobody cares uh, uh, on this uh, point in the government or in the uh, political scene besides us. Yeah, I, I would love to see the EU stake out some independent positions, things that, I mean, not just to have conflicts. If, you know, if, if you agree with the United States, that's great, you work together. But if, if you're doing something that, uh, that's better for, for Europe, uh, that, you know, where you have some advantage, then you should, you should be able to do it. But, uh, yeah. And in, within the European Union, it's very important, secondly, after the United States and uh, Britain, the Anglo-Saxon word, what the French are doing. So the French, the typical French egoism or chauvinism, economic and cultural chauvinism, sometimes leads to good results outside of it as a collateral benefit for others. Not intentionally, but, well, they can't prevent that others have an advantage too. And we've seen this in a, with the nuclear power question, where the French enforced in the taxonomy of, uh, of things that uh, Nuclear power is uh, CO2 free, so it's uh, carbon carbon uh, neutral, yeah. and so we introduced the idea and the fact into the European law that nuclear power is a way. So if Germany refuses, it has nothing to do with juridical restrictions whatsoever. And the second thing is that Macron uh, does not want the accession the very fast accession, for instance, of, of the West Balkans, and he declared NATO as brain dead not that long ago. He uh, declared brain dead to NATO, and he stands for a more continental European way, besides US, besides London, too. And that could be a way, what could lead yeah. to some emancipation. But it's only uh, if it fits to French interests and that's the pr another precondition. So we have two preconditions, what Washington does and, and London and what Paris does. So, Well, maybe the, maybe the French elections will move things in a positive direction. Mm. Uh, it looks like there might be some hope. Mm.
<laughs> I'm not so convinced. Um, not so convinced. <laughs> In terms of foreign policy, there is a, a little hope. In other terms, less because it has no majority in the in the French uh, Congress, Senate. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, in, in certain questions, I think that's that's the only hope. It's a desperate hope, but the only hope what's left. So. <laughs> because um, we see um, the uh, leader of uh, the companies, the leader of the economy and the leader of the political scene uh, are meeting in Davos and um, they are called Bilderberg and um, so we have um, a worldwide uh, um, prediction um, of, of the yeah, political way like it is and um, to change it, it will be very very difficult we want to but uh, yeah we know you have said the deep state uh, and uh, this is a point um, we have to to be there yeah i think of the i think of the bilderberg well the bilderberg the the uh, the davos organization uh, they have about 2,000 people who show up uh, for each of their meetings. It, it, a while back, it cost $200,000 for a ticket, so most of us would not uh, would not uh, be allowed in. Um, but then, you know, if you think it through, uh, once you get a certain number of people, you can't really do business, it's, it's too awkward, so you have to have a smaller group that does the business. And so these people come together, they, they fly their, their corporate jets, and uh, uh, they come to meet uh, uh, at Davos, and, uh, and when they do, there's got to be a structure, there's an organization, I, who knows, do they have five people, do they have 20 people, I don't know. but. They set the agenda. They decide in advance what things are going to be discussed. And, uh, and whoever's in charge of this group of five or 20 people, he is saying, okay, these are the points that will go on the agenda. And then the question really is, who tells him what to put on the agenda? And we're, we are not intended to know who those people are, but, uh, but they create the agenda. 2,000 of the world's most powerful, wealthiest people come together, and essentially they get their instructions. Now they talk about issues, whether it's global warming or COVID or whatever is the topic of the day, but then they fly back and they know that if you want to succeed, if you want to be a mega billionaire, you're going to help to implement those policies. And yet, they really didn't have anything to do with creating them. It's the man who makes the agenda. Whoever sets the agenda, those are the things that get discussed. Maybe sometimes they can't arrive at a consensus, but when you have 2,000 people, there's who speaks for 2,000 people? It's 2,000's a mob, so mostly they're just there to get their instructions and then fly out from there and implement the policies. And the policies, I'm afraid, are bad. I, I, don't, think, I don't think they're looking to say, okay, we, we want to make sure that, uh, that the widow is cared for. We want to make sure that, uh, that uh, children get a good, healthy education. We want to make sure that people in Syria have housing. Uh, no, they want to make sure people in Syria do not have housing. They want to make sure that people in Syria do not have medicine to treat common ailments. Um, so I don't look at this as a positive organization. And I, this is the problem with all global organizations, is the bigger they get, the more distant they are from the people that they represent, which means the less voice you, you, all of us have in, uh, in implementing policies. So I, honestly, there, there are countries that are 
not very democratic, but sometimes they're a little apprehensive. If, if the economy is, is not going well, they get a little nervous about it. But if you're, if you're the boys from, from Davos, you don't have to worry. It's all, it's all going to work out. Uh, so, so some of these organizations do have to be responsive, even, even governments that are not what we call democratic. They, they got to listen to the people or, or the people get angry and do something. Perhaps there's time to, to draw a little bottom line on the things the last 30 years, uh, starting in Syria and looking a bit behind. In my opinion, and perhaps you agree or could agree, uh, it's, I compare it with a heavyweight fight. So it's 30 years, 30 rounds, or well, one round counting two years, so 15 rounds, heavyweight championship fight. And uh, the NATO, US and NATO, did a lot of punches all over the world, did a lot of action, did a lot of BS automatically. Yeah. The Russians on the other side, there was little action, and the actions they followed, uh, it was not successful, totally successful. They did little, and Syria is stabilizing, and Afghanistan, the withdrawal looked much more elegant than that what NATO did in August of last year. So that's bottom line, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for the discussion, and um, yeah. We have um, get some uh, some news and we have get some uh, impression of your point of view and it is very warm uh, to to have this discussion besides the mainstream and uh, yeah thank you very much. Well, thank you. I appreciate uh, all the all of the input, all the things that I'm learning as as I hear from your experiences.